I'm turning this morning to the book of Acts, chapter 16. Acts, chapter 16. Thankful to see each one that's here this morning. Glad to be back in the service with you. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're thankful that you've come. And trust you receive a blessing from being here today. Acts chapter 16, we want to begin reading in verse 25. Before we begin, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day and for the blessings of it, Lord. I thank you for the many things that you've done for us, Lord. I thank you for the ways that you've helped us and you've blessed us, Lord. I pray that you would help us this morning in what we stand in need of. I pray you would forgive me the ways I failed you, Lord. I pray that you would use me as you see fit this morning, Lord, that we could deliver the message that you've given us, Lord. I pray that you would open our hearts to receive it. I pray, Lord, uh, that you would open the hearts of those that are lost, that they could see their need of Jesus, Lord, that they could be saved. I pray you'd convict their heart. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, give us wisdom as your people to understand your word. Blessing the requests that were mentioned, that, Lord, you know each one and each need. And I pray, Lord, for, again, those that are lost, that they could see their need of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would bless us through the day. Forgive us of our sin. For these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 16, verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors opened, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. And Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And then he called for a light, and sprang in, came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in the house. Excuse me, I thought I was going to sneeze. I didn't want to do that straight into the mic. Oh, okay, so there's some important things that are mentioned. We want to focus particularly on one that was said this morning, the question that this uh, jailer asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? All right, so let's, I, I want you to, men, to mention a couple of things about the, the, uh, the circumstances, about the context of the Scripture. First of all, the, uh, Paul and Silas are in Philippi. And uh, here in Philippi, they have, uh, they have been arrested. And, and the reason they were arrested, there was a lady who was following them with a spirit of divination. And this lady that was following them with this spirit of divination, uh, the, the spirit itself was crying as, it, as, as the lady was following Paul and Silas. And, and the spirit was crying that these men were the servants of the Most High God. Now, I want you to kind of get this in your, in your mind, that this woman with this spirit of divination, and she's crying out through this evil spirit that these men are the servants of the Most High God. That to me, that's always amazing how people could see these evil spirits, and these evil spirits would cry out about the Lord or, uh, cry out about something of nature. But rather than these men listening to what was taking place and, and, and hearing what was going on, what they did was they were upset because the source of their income was gone. And so they had Paul and Silas in prison. They were upset about it. They had Paul and Silas in prison. Of course, they were wrongfully in prison. And this man, uh, the prisoner here, falls asleep at midnight. He had received a strict charge. So they were in the inner prison. And uh, his life was on the line and he knew uh, that if something happened to these men it would be better for him to take his own life and to answer the consequences of what was going to take place having uh, with these prisoners having escaped but Paul and Silas did not escape nor the rest of the prisoners uh, they were simply all there and so uh, the man comes to him and eventually asks them the question a lot of times we, uh, you, you think about it for a moment Paul and Silas did some wonderful things there it was through the Lord that they did that it was through the Lord that they had the power to do that but it was God who gave the increase in other words it was God who initiated in the heart of the Philippian jailer uh, the, the, the thoughts of, of even looking at Paul and Silas 
of seeing the difference that was in them. And, and God was working in his heart. God was changing him in that moment uh, that, that he could be saved, that he could come to that place to, to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he comes to them and he asks them this question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now I want to mention a few things. Again, we'll narrow down on this. But let me ask you a question this morning. One, do you even want to be saved? If you're here and you're lost, do you desire to be saved? There has never been anybody who trusted the Lord Jesus Christ that did not want to be saved. And so in order to be saved, you have to desire to be saved. This morning, if you're lost, do you, do you desire that? Do you desire to, to trust the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved? Jesus said, seek and you shall what? Find. You've got to look for him. You've got to search. This morning, do you desire to be saved? Secondly, after that, let me ask you this. If you do, do desire to be saved, and I, I hope that's the case if you're here this morning and you're lost, because if you don't desire to be saved... You are, uh, that your, your end is in hell. If you continue and you die in the, in the shape that you're in. This morning, if you desire to be saved, do you know how to be saved? Well, that's what this man was asking. How, how can I be saved? How do I do that? How do I be saved? Now, this is a question that's been asked for a long period of time. How, how can a person be saved? There's a lot of, you get a lot of, you ask that question to a lot of people and you get a lot of different answers. But there's one way that's true. There's one way that works. There's one way that produces results. And there's one way that's biblical and those are the same way. So there's one way of salvation. Now people can tell you a lot of things and there can be a lot of different ways of salvation according to the world. But biblically, there is one way. And it's the only way that works. This morning, there's one plan of salvation. How can I be saved? Now, let me mention, I'm just going to kind of start with the negative, And then we'll get to the positive uh, after, after a moment. What is it not? How, how can, what, what is it the world say that it is not? Let me ask you this. What percentage of people in the world, how many people are in the world? Does anybody know? Somewhere just short of 8 billion. Somewhere just short of 8 billion people. Of 8 billion people, do you know what percentage of people are atheist? The reason I ask that question is because it seems like it's going to be a pretty good sized number, right? 7%. Somewhere around 7%. That means 93% percent of eight billion people believe in a religion and that there is some way that they need to reconcile themselves with God all of those religions disagree on how that's done but 93 percent of eight billion people agree that it needs to be done does that make sense We can see through that that man already has an understanding within himself. He knows he's wrong with God and he needs to do something in order to be right with God. The disagreement comes when we say, okay, well, what is it? That's what this man says, what can I do to be saved? Sir, what must I do to be saved? The first thing that you get, you ask, and it's amazing to me, you, you kind of assume living in South Mississippi, we live in the a Pine Belt, you assume that most people today have an understanding of the gospel. What it means, you ask somebody how to go to heaven, ask, just start asking, if you have an opportunity, ask people, do you, have, do you know how to go to heaven? Ask them what they say. You have to be good enough. That's what most of them are going to say. Most people will tell you, you have to be good enough to go to heaven. You do, that's, that's works for salvation. So here, at this point, we have a split. There is a, a group of people who believe in works for salvation. And there is a group of people who believe in salvation by grace. Every religion in the world believes in works for salvation except one. 
And that's Christianity. And the major part of Christianity believes in works for salvation, except a small group of them. Salvation by grace means that it's given to us freely. We do nothing for it. We do not deserve it. But it's given to us freely. And it's given to us freely, of course, by the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation, in other words, cannot be earned in any way. The Scripture is very clear on, on, on this. In fact, very, the Scripture is very clear on, on all of it. But the point is that, that Scripture answers this question for us. Is it works or is it grace? Well, it can't be both or it can't be any combination of both. Romans chapter 4 answers that question for us. It can't be a combination. If it's a work... It's reckoned of debt. That's what Romans chapter 4 says somewhere in the first few verses of that chapter. If Abraham were saved by works, then God gave him salvation as a debt to him. God owed it to him for the work that he did for God, right? If you do work for a business and you fulfill your duties for that business, at the end of the week you've got your hand out, right? You're looking for something. They owe you money. And they owe you that by law. God doesn't owe you anything and will never owe you anything. And if salvation comes through works, then it is not of grace. It's given by debt, but that's not the case. And that's what Paul is trying to, to the point he's trying to make through Romans chapter 4. He's helping us understand that Abraham was saved by grace. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. God saved him by grace through faith. Not of debt. So we have this division. Next, even in the people who believe salvation being of grace, uh, there is a group of people who Really, there's, there's, there's two major errors that come in. I can't deal with all of them this morning, but two major errors that I want to deal with. One is the idea of, of prayer. When a person's saved, I was saved, I was praying. I was talking to the Lord. I believe prayer has a part of it. You're communicating with God, and I believe prayer has a part of it. Scripture says in Romans chapter 10 that, uh, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. I believe communication with God is extremely important. A person being saved, uh, that, that typically it's the case they're going, to be, they're going to be praying. Maybe not moving their mouth or something of that nature, but they're speaking to the Lord in their, in their mind. But does a prayer save you? There is a group of people that believe that prayer saves you. I don't know all about who that is, but I've seen it. Sinner's prayer. That if, if, I, if I ask you this morning, typically what they would do is if, you know, if you're lost this morning, you want to be saved, you raise your hand, come see me after church, I'll give you whatever the case is. I'll tell you these are the words that you need to say. You say these words, and you're saved. That doesn't work. You get most of those prayers and you start reading those prayers. I want you to do that. If you ever see them, you read what the prayer says. I want you to go find those words in the Bible. Is that what Jesus preached? Jesus said, except you likewise repent. Or except you repent, rather, you shall all likewise perish. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. He didn't say, you know what, what you need to do is you need to invite me in your heart. Is there a difference? Well, that, that depends. Depends on the heart of the believer. Depends on the heart of the individual that's saying. The point is this morning that simply saying a prayer is not going to save you. Because God looks upon the heart. And the heart has to repent. The heart has to turn from itself and turn to the living God. And telling somebody to say some words is not going to accomplish that. All right, so let's go a little further than that idea. Uh, what, what would be after that? Another is just the idea. That I, I had a lady tell me one day, she came to me after the service, and she said, I, I would like to be baptized. I said, yes, ma'am. 
I said, I'd love to baptize you, but are you saved? And she said, I am. I know I'm saved. She said, I was baptized in the church really young. She said, but I got saved after I, I was baptized. In fact, I, I got saved not, not long after I was baptized, but I got saved. And she said, I never got it right, but I want to be baptized. I want to get it right. I want to make it right with the church, with the Lord. I just want to have it all right. I said, okay. And she said, what happened was when I was about 12 years old, I walked out of church one day after the service, and somebody, one of the adults, came up to me and made the statement to me that you're about the age to join the church. She said, so I did what I thought I, I needed to do. I joined the church. I made a profession of faith. She said, but I didn't, I never was saved. This morning you can make a profession of faith. You can be baptized. You can do all of the things of a church member and still be lost and still be dying and still be headed to hell having not trusted Jesus Christ. I want to give you a couple of scriptures for this. The Ethiopian eunuch, as the Ethiopian eunuch was traveling back to Ethiopia, and he was reading from the book of Isaiah, and Philip joined himself to the chariot, and began in Isaiah chapter 53 to preach to him Jesus Christ. After a period of time, the scripture tells us that the Ethiopian eunuch said, here's water, what hinders me from being baptized? Here we are. Why can't I be baptized? What, what did Philip tell him? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. And they went down in into, into the water and he baptized him at that point. By the way, do you know most translations take out the verse that he says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Most common translations of the Bible take that verse all the way out. And it reads as if he says, what must I do to, you know, what hinder me from being baptized? And they stopped the chariot and went down into the water and baptized him. Do you know there's a lot of groups of people who believe that baptism saves you? Water baptism, water baptism does not save you. And the Bible proves that. Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist was preaching he was baptizing, actually. And there was a group of uh, Pharisees and scribes that came to his baptism. And they were wanting to be baptized by him. And he called them a generation of vipers. And he made the statement to them, he said, bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. In other words, prove to me that you've trusted Christ, that you've been saved, and then I'll baptize you. This morning, have you trusted Jesus Christ? Have you been saved? All right, so now let's look at the folks. I want you to notice what he says. Verse 30, he says, he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And this is what Paul tells him. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Believe on on the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean now? Believe. The word believe does not mean today in our use of the word what it meant quite a few years ago. So let me tell you about the idea of believe. In what year was the United States founded? What year did United, the United States declare their independence? 17, what, 76, right? 1776. Y'all believe that? Were you there? Did you see it? Who was the first president of the United States? George Washington. Were you at his inauguration? How do you know George Washington was the first president of the United States? You weren't there to witness it for yourself. Well, we believe it, right? That's a head knowledge. I believe that's to be true. That's what's been taught. There's evidence for it. Some pretty good evidence. And I believe it. From the time I was 
old enough, I, at the time I was old enough to begin to comprehend sounds my parents were teaching me about Jesus Christ. There was never a time in my life where I didn't believe that Jesus, or that I, that, that I didn't believe in Jesus, in his existence, in his death, his burial, even his resurrection. I believed it happened. But there's a difference between believe it happened and it trust the soul. That's what he's talking about. Even in the, that as a child, as I was raised, there came a time where I had to put my faith in it. I had to believe in it to the saving of my soul. And that's what he means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. To put our faith in. I didn't just accept it as a head knowledge and say, okay, well, I, I believe, you know, that. Uh, that, that. That's probably a real account. I've been taught it forever. They've got pretty good evidence. I believe that's probably the case. There's a difference in the, in the two ideas of believe. Through the Scripture... You talk about salvation. In fact, you talk about any topic. There's a, there's a statement made in the book of Timothy. I believe it's 2 Timothy chapter 2. That a man is to study to show himself approved workman unto God. Needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. What, what, what it means to talk about rightly dividing. That's not talking about divisions in the scripture and cutting it up. It's talking about being able to take the pieces and put them together. As if it were a puzzle. And there's times where you see statements made. You look at the Ethiopian unit. You look at uh, Paul. You look at Cornelius. You look at uh, the Philippian jailer. You look at all of these accounts of salvation. And every time the Bible says a statement to be made about salvation, you look at them all together. And then you can begin to put, these, put the puzzle together and see the whole picture you know what the Bible says a lot of times about salvation? Repent. Repent. What does that mean? What is, it, what is the definition of the word repent? It means to do what? To turn. That's what it means, to turn. And so if, if I have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I have to repent, then those words got to meet somewhere. They've got to be very similar about the same or having to do with one another. When you think about the idea of turning in repentance, don't think about a person walking down a road and turning around. That's, that's not a good example of the idea of turning. Think about a person with an awful diet that's eaten bad food for a long period of time. And all of a sudden their health starts to bother them. And they have to change their diet. They have to turn from one source of food to another source of food over here. You have to turn from something to something. In fact, you cannot repent if you don't turn from something to something. If you just turn from something, you didn't repent. You just quit. You have to turn from something to something else. That's the idea of repentance. And so this morning when you talk about what, what must I do to be saved, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ has everything to do with repentance. Let me tell you why. First off, you have to turn from. What is, what is this idea of turning from? The first, first idea of turning from something. Have you ever heard anybody describe the process of salvation and say, well, what you have to do is you have to let go. If you want to be saved this morning, you have to surrender. What does that mean? What it means is, stop. I was talking to a young man one day, and, and, and I, I preached a, a similar message, and he was asking me, he said, I... I don't, know what to, I don't know what to do to be saved. He said, the Lord's working on me. And I, I, I began to lay out the process of salvation. You've got to put your faith in Jesus Christ. You've got to believe on him. And he said, I'm trying. I said, quit. Trying. Surrender. He said, I don't know what that means. I don't know what it means. As long as you are trying to be saved this morning, you are trying to do it yourself. Your faith is in you. Trying to understand it. 
trying to figure it out, trying to get the words right, trying to speak the word or pray the prayer right, trying to conduct your life right, whatever it is, trying to do it yourself. This morning, if you want to be saved, stop trying. Surrender. And as far as that goes, all of us in the building that are saved, you don't just repent one time. We're to repent every day of our life. Every major spiritual battle that is won in your life is won through surrender. Because God will not start, start fighting until we stop. So if you want to win the battle, surrender. Let God fight. Let God fight for you. Trust in Him to win the battle for you. Philippians chapter 3, I believe we tried to get across some ideas from that a little while back. You talk about a person's confidence. A confidence talks about a source of faith. And when you talk about where is your confidence, you ask somebody if they're saved, yes, I'm saved. What's your confidence in? How do you know that you're saved? What, what makes you think you're saved? Well, you get a lot of different answers that made a made a profession of faith, or I did this, or I did that. And sometimes you'll get, uh, I, had, I talked to a young man one day, he called me, and, and, and he said, how did, you, how did you know the Lord called you to preach? I said, I, I said I, I'll answer your question. I just I want to talk to you about something else first. And he said, okay. I said, how do you know you're saved? And he said, well, I've been baptized twice. The reason I asked him, I said, how do you know you're saved? What I was asking him is, what is your confidence in? Just different words. And his confidence was in the fact that he had been baptized. And he said, I've been baptized twice. And the second time I was baptized, he said, I was about 17 years old. And it really felt like it did something. I said, really? And he said, yeah. I said, let me tell you how I got saved. And I began to lay out Jesus Christ and what took place and, and how the, my, the, the experience and how God saved my soul. And he said, I've never had that happen to me before. And I said, I, I asked him, I said, where you at? And he said, I'm at home. I said, I'm going to have the phone up. You talk to the Lord and get this right between you and him. And I said, I'll see you in just a minute. And he said, Okay. About halfway to, to his house, he called me and he said, well, I got it right with the Lord and I'm saved. And he said, I've got peace. <laughs> Thank the Lord. It's wonderful. But the point was his confidence was in something else. His confidence was in something he did. Paul said that if anybody had any reason to be confident in the flesh, he had a reason to be confident. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. A Pharisee of the Pharisees. of God's chosen people, specifically the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised the eighth day. But he, said he, he suffered the loss of all of that, that he could win Christ. In other words, he could not put his confidence in those things. He wouldn't save him. He had to take his confidence out of himself. But he had to put it in Jesus. This morning, the first thing is turning away from yourself, which is surrendering. If you want to be saved this morning, you've got to surrender. You've got to give up. Stop trying. And then let God save you. Ask Him to do it for you. There was a, I, I don't know what, something that happened to me I guess as the Lord was burdening my heart and I tried to be saved and I tried to be saved and I tried to be saved and right about the time I gave up I remember thinking really quickly it looks like whatever I know no matter what I do I'm gonna go to hell that's exactly right because there is nothing that I could do and about the time I realized that, God helped me also realize that he could save me. And I looked to him to do it for me. 
This morning, if you're going to be saved, you believe in Jesus Christ. You see what believing in Jesus means that you've got to look to Jesus to do something for you that you can't do for yourself. You're going to look to Jesus to save you. He's the one that gave his life. Now, I want you to notice something else. He gave his life on the cross at Calvary for the debt of sin. And God raised him from the dead the third day. He's still alive today. You turn to him. Not turning to some other work. Not turning to a profession of faith. Not turning to a prayer. Not turning to a baptism. Not turning to a work. Turning to Jesus Christ and getting it right between you and him. Now I want you to notice what Paul didn't say. Verse 31, he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. In other words, what he said in the part about thy house, and not only is this good enough for you, but it's good enough for everybody in your home too. Anybody who believes in it, be saved. But this morning, he didn't ask him, what's your background? Well, that depends how you grow up. Paul didn't ask him those questions because they didn't matter. It didn't matter how the Philippian jailer grew up. It don't matter how you grow or grew up this morning. It's not important about whether you were raised under a religious system or not. It's not important about how you were raised. It's not important about how the Philippian jailer was raised. What was important is whether or not he trusted Jesus Christ. I had a man tell me one day, trying to talk to him, he was crying, a big old, big man. And he was weeping, which was extremely unusual for this man. And I was trying to witness to him about Jesus. I knew he was under conviction. And he said, I cannot be saved. And I said, Jesus will save anyone who trusts in him. Anyone. He said, you don't know what I've done in my life. I said, you're right. I don't. I have no idea. But I know this. Jesus died for every sin. He began to tell me about the war that he fought in. He began to tell me about the people he had to kill. Things that I don't understand. I couldn't sit there and tell him that I did. I I didn't. But I said, let me tell you something. I don't remember the man's name, but many years ago when I was a young man, even a teenager maybe, I I don't remember, but there was a man who they called the Unabomber. Y'all remember him? I had never heard his testimony, but the claim is that right before they gave him lethal injection, he trusted the Lord Jesus Christ and was saved. I, I, I don't know that. But if that man truly trusted Jesus before they injected him, he had eternal life. He's alive today. He's with the Lord in heaven. Why? Why? It didn't matter what he had done. We are all sinners. Every one of us. We are all sinners. Every one of us have come short of the glory of God. How short is not important. We have come short. We have failed. And we need a Savior. And Jesus Christ is that Savior. We can't work our way back. And trying to work your way back to God is like robbing a bank and giving half of it to charity. And then telling the the judge, well, I gave half of it to charity. I figured y'all let me off. It doesn't negate the wrong that you've done. And if God's a righteous judge, and he is, he will judge you righteously. You will be condemned. You are already condemned. Today, what do you need to do to be saved? You need to look to Jesus Christ who gave his life for you. This morning, surrender. Quit trying. Give up. And let him save you.
Let him do it for you. He gave his life in your place. And if you'll believe on him, you can have eternal life this morning while we have a verse of a song.